come along today and help us find these cheaters and get rid of the non good, non demonizing, non Jesus loving goddamn cheaters. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Potatoes, we're gonna kill them today! God damn, I don't know why the subject matter was that important, but we just felt like it would be really, really funny for two Asian guys to be rednecks and want to get rid of the Chinese people in the neighborhood. Contrary to what most filmmakers believe, sometimes a script is not needed, and then we would just film one scene, and they're like, what should we do next? Why don't we crouch down next to the garage? I'm like, all right, cool. And what I remember from that day, I don't know why, but Joe couldn't stop saying, Chinaman needs vitamins. I know Chinaman don't like vitamins. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna get some vitamins and put it in your throat. And he would just repeat that, like as soon as the camera turned off, he kept saying, Chinamans need vitamins. How I realized what a passion was, is when people are willing to give themselves their own homework. So after we were done with chicken hunting, I just know we shot it and we had a great time. I didn't know when I was gonna see the finished product, but when Joe called me the day of, telling me he already finished, I was like, oh shit, like I don't know anybody that initiates something and then later on completes it on their own. Like for school, which I thought was my passion at the time, I would do my classwork, but if I wasn't assigned anything, I'm not gonna go home and try to study like two more chapters ahead. So when I subconsciously realized that, oh shit, Joe is willing to go the extra mile and edit this, and I'm willing to meet up and make sacrifices with my friends from hanging out to spend the whole Saturday filming with Joe, I'm like, oh shit, this is a passion. I think my first, first passion was martial arts. I realized I really liked it because I would memorize forms from my favorite movies and on the weekends, as soon as I wake up, I would just go in the backyard and I would just start like doing random shit. I would put on random clothes and I would reenact scenes from like blood sport and I would just be in the backyard for hours practicing. I didn't know what a passion was because I was so young, but I just knew that if I had some free time, that's how I was gonna spend my free time, doing martial arts. And to be a ninja, you gotta think like a ninja, motherfucker! Anderson Silva, Travis Adele, GSP, BJ Penn, Justin Bieber, fuck your uncle! And then when I was 10 years old, I joined the school band at my elementary school and I played drums. And after like playing like the basic shit that my, the band teacher would teach me, I would take all kinds of different instruments, AKA like the laundry basket, or a paint bucket, or my mom's pots and pans, and I would take it and put it in the backyard, and I would start banging on all of them, and I would just play for like two, three hours at a time. And my friends would come over, and they would rap over those beats. And then my friend had this thing called a talk boy, and it's pretty much like a Home Alone version of a Walkman. And then we're recording, we listen to it, because they had a built-in speaker, and we'd be like, damn, that shit's tight. <laughs> So passions, technically, they're first world problems. Like it's, we're not worried about money, we're not worried about food, we're not worried about some evil regime coming into our house and blowing shit up. It's something that first world countries can actually worry about. And I think for my parents, choosing what you'd like to do isn't a luxury they had. They always have to focus on putting food on the table, paying for rent and all that. So when it came to what does my son want to pursue, I think they just saw everything as hobbies. And they never saw that anyone can take any hobby past a certain level. Anything past that is just wasting your time on it because it's not a real career. It's just so weird that this generation gap causes like such a big difference in like how they want us to live our own lives, you know? Well, it's just that one thing is that we gotta find a way to get them out of our business. Yeah. Because we have kind of like a life path of our own. And I'm sure they just want what's best for us, but we just want to make our own life choices. And it's cool that our parents like like think that they know what's best for us, but like, oh, don't hang out with this guy. Yeah, or, yeah. I don't want you to do that job. I want you to do this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, you know, all the time. But I think sometimes they just got to realize that maybe the best decisions that are made for us mm -hmm. are made by ourselves. I didn't know that my creative outlet was entertainment until YouTube. Me and Joey would always just call or text each other when we had a funny idea. And one day, 
I was just getting ready for school and I was just singing to myself. Every day, go to school, to be the good boy. And I was like, oh shit, that's pretty funny. And I called Joe and I was like, hey yo, I got this melody, this hook, you know what I mean, for this motherfucking song, you know what I'm saying? And then he was like, what? Damn, that's tight. And then I sang him the song. And then a week later, he went to go meet up with Jay Phonics to record some real stuff. And he goes, dude, we made a beat together. And it had all this like Casio sounds like. And I'm like, fuck, that's perfect. Hey, Uncle Sam, do you do the dancing? I do the dancing. I have to go to school first. Oh, okay. Every day, go to school. When those two came together, comedy and music, it was such a beautiful thing because it was the current passion mixed in with the passion of my childhood. And the fact that we were able to do it and everything was self-created, that's when I realized, oh shit, when you take explorative arts and you combine that with an audience, that's entertainment. Our first real taste of fame was we had this meet and greet at Tasty, and we didn't really know how many people were gonna show up, but we just set it up anyways because we wanted to sell some shirts and get to know our fans and see like what would happen. And the meet and greet was supposed to start at 2 p.m. Our buddy who lived down the street stopped by Tasty to help set it up, and he was like, dude, you guys aren't gonna believe this. It's 10 a.m. and there's a line. And we're like, what the fuck? That's crazy. And then we printed 200 shirts that day. They all sold out. And I think over 400 people showed up back then. They all knew our sayings and they would like cuss at us in Vietnamese and say all kinds of stuff. And we're like, fuck, this is crazy. Every time I want to drink, I always drink the tasty, tasty. Every time I wake up, I always am so thirsty, thirsty. And then I met Gio. To be honest, the first time I ever saw Gio, she used to work at this bookstore called Textmania and they sold textbooks across the street from Elac. And the first time I saw her, I was like, damn! And I always thought she was out of my league. So I didn't even try to say hi or anything like that. I probably gotta be a cholo or have like a unsupported baby somewhere or stole a car or like mow some lawns for her to like recognize me. So I was like, I'm out of her league. She would never want to get with the future doctor. When I first got to know her, she looked super Mexican. Fucking like, Alconet. And over the years, like, she's, even to me now, I'm like, wait, are you half Filipino? Are you like Filipino, Italian? Like, now she looks Asian. In the beginning, she just became one of the guys because, like, we would always all kick it together. Like, we had a pretty big circle of friends. We would always kick it together. So we always had, like, bonfires. We would go snowboarding together, go to raves and massives together. And then it wasn't until one day, where me, Gio, and my other buddy Richard were supposed to go snowboarding together. I was waiting at her house, and then I think we're like, wait, where the fuck's Richard? Or, oh, fuck, he's Vietnamese. Vietnamese people are always like, we have to leave without him. We tried texting him, calling him. He didn't reply, so we just left. And on our way to snowboarding, the highway was snowed in, and no car can get anywhere. So we have to turn our cars off and wait for them to shovel the snow out. And in that car, we just had to kick it for four hours. And by us kicking it, I think we started to really get to know each other and she realized how handsome I was. So she started to uh, like me. Once me and Gio started dating, I started taking her with me to a bunch of industry stuff. I went to ISA and I had a hard time networking with people because I just felt like they were from a different walk of life and, and they didn't speak the same language with me. But Jill, she was able to be much more social than me and within that night, she was able to help me get acquainted with Ryan Higa, Far East Movement, Lil C Dog, like a bunch of people that I watched on YouTube and I was like, oh shit, like because of her, she was able to have us meet. Even though I've already been in the same proximity with these people multiple times before, but I think I was just so like in this gangster mentality where I'm just like sitting in the corner dogging people. I'm like, I ain't gonna say what's up if they don't say what's up. And then because of that, I was able to meet everyone. And then so we were like, you know what, Jill's actually really helpful to us. Maybe we should bring her on. 
and this is what made me really really love Gio even more than I did. When discussing like my career path and future choices with her, she told me that if I really wanted to pursue JK and as unknowing what the future is, she was going to support me 100%. She had a uh, 9 to 5 bank job at the time and she told me she would be willing to support me the whole time I pursued my passion and then I was like, fuck, damn, you make me want to lick your pussy right now. Because what I've been looking for in a, in a romantic relationship is that ride or die mentality and that was the most ride or die thing I ever heard. That was more so than even my parents. You know, like my parents never told me I'm going to support you if you pursue your passion. They told me I'll support you if you go to medical school, but never to pursue your passion. So when she told me that, I was like, fuck, she really loves me. And fine, if I have the support of at least one loved one, then I'm going to do it. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm really excited about this new documentary series that we're coming out with. Um, we're able to share a very personal and more intimate side of JK and how everything came together. And let me know in the comments below of how you guys are liking it. But I know usually we do a lot of comedic stuff. This is one of those things that really hit home because as we're making it and as we're talking and interviewing each other and as we watch the finished product, it takes us back. It takes us on a walk towards memory lane where we get to reminisce about all the things that it took to create JK. And there's a lot of like little details that we forget about now because JK is such a big moving machine now and we're pumping out so much content that sometimes it's really humbling to see and watch the origins. And for me, I feel like the take home message is don't worry about what the future holds. It's always important to dream big. But the most important thing is to enjoy the struggle and enjoy the journey. And me watching my own episode, it made me realize because we didn't have such a huge goal, we just enjoyed our chemistry together and enjoyed our craft. That is the sole reason why we're able to last so long. So um, I hope that that video also inspired you guys too. Always follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And see you guys next Sunday. Peace. If we're shopping for Ferrari, yeah, like the more fucking gangster the car looks you're like damn but if you're looking for your everyday commuter then it's like well how reliable is this thing and you start looking at cameras and stuff so i wasn't viewing geo in, in that way anymore so are you calling geo a camry <laughs> in the world of ferraris well at that time i was looking for a camry so geo ended up to be the ferrari that was also able to be daily driven like a porsche <laughs>